Probably the most significant addition to AtRisk 6.0 is its new set of time series tools. These allow you to fit time series processes to time series data, and they enable you to define time series processes as inputs for a simulation. These new tools are analogous to the existing distribution fitting and define distributions tools. Just as the distribution fitting tool lets you fit a distribution to a column of data, the time series fit and batch fit tools let you fit one or more time series processes to one or more columns of time series data. Similarly, just as the define distributions tool lets you choose a distribution for an uncertain input, the time series define tool lets you choose a time series process for a set of time series forecasts. Fit. The time series fit tool is used to fit a time series process to a single time series variable. The example illustrated here is of the monthly Dow Jones Industrial Average since 1990. Note that the time series data often has a date column at the left. Although it is not absolutely necessary, it is useful to separate this date column from the time series column or columns with a blank column. You certainly don't want to fit the date column, and this blank column decreases the chances that you inadvertently include the date column in the data range to be fitted. To fit the Dow data, select any cell in column D and select Fit from the time series dropdown on the at risk ribbon. This leads to the dialog box you see here. It shows a graph of the series and graphs of two important related quantities, the autocorrelation function, or ACF, and the partial autocorrelation function, PACF. These are useful for identifying the type of time series you have. The theory behind fitting assumes that your time series is stationary. This means that its mean and variance are constant through time. It also means that there shouldn't be any seasonality. Often these assumptions are violated. For example, you can see that except for two downturns, the Dow has been trending upward. It is definitely not stationary. Therefore, the original Dow series cannot be fit directly. It must first be transformed to make it stationary. The middle left section of the dialog box helps you do this. You can check any of the options, such as Dtrend, to induce stationarity. Or you can click the Auto Detect button to have At Risk do it for you. When you click the Auto Detect button, the dialog box changes, as you see here. Now a logarithmic transformation is performed to stabilize the variance, and first order differences are taken to get rid of the trend. As you can see, the resulting series in red is essentially noise now. And the ACF and PACF graphs have also changed considerably. The transform series is now ready for fitting. At this point, you can click the Fit button directly, or you can click the Series to Fit tab. It shows all of the candidate processes in At Risk's time series collection. These include autoregressive and moving average processes, Brownian motion and variations of it, and autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity processes. As in the gallery of distributions you see in the Define Distributions window, you can check or uncheck as many of these as you like. At Risk will try fitting each of the checked ones to the given time series. Now I will click Fit. Here are the results. For each of the checked processes that makes sense for this particular time series, At Risk finds the best fitting member, such as the best MA1 process, and it ranks these according to a fitting criterion. In this example, it uses the AIC criterion. For the Dow series, the moving average process of order 1, MA1, using the parameters above the graph, right here, provides the best fit. 
you can see its projection into the future in the right section of the graph. The legend helps explain this. The four buttons at the bottom left provide more options. The left two are the usual help button and the edit and export button. The third button is for synchronizing. Instead of having the forecasts start after the last historical observation, you can have them start at the beginning of the historical data, as shown here. You are essentially forecasting known values as well as future values. Finally, the fourth button is for animation. When it is toggled on, you see a series of red random sample paths in the graph. If you want to generate future forecasts in your worksheet, you can click the Write to Cells button and then specify a range. For example, the forecasts here are for the next 12 months. These forecasts are live. At Risk enters an array formula in the specified range that contains the risk MA1 function with the parameters you just saw. You can see it is an array function because it has the curly brackets around it. And that array function is in this whole range. Because this is entered as an array formula, it works as a unit. For example, you can't delete the contents of a single cell in the range. You would have to delete them all. As usual with at-risk distributions, Static values appear in the range unless you toggle the at-risk dice button to random. Then they jump around. These future forecasts can now be used as inputs to an at-risk simulation, just like any other input distributions are used. Batch fit. The time series dropdown also has a batch fit item. This enables you to fit multiple related time series all at once. This not only saves time, but it has the extra benefit that it estimates correlations between the time series. The data shown here of monthly bond yields of AAA and BAA bonds can be used to illustrate the batch fit tool. To fit both series at once, select any cell in column D or E and select Batch Fit from the Time Series dropdown. This brings up the dialog box you see here. Again, the date column has been separated from the time series data by a blank column, so at risk guesses correctly that the data range is in columns D and E. It doesn't include the date. The issue of stationarity still applies. But now it is trickier because multiple time series are involved. One transformation might be required for one time series, and another transformation might be required for another. If you manually check the transformation options, such as the logarithm transformation, your choices will be applied to each of the time series. Therefore, it is usually better to check the auto detect option. At risk will then try to find the best transformation, if any, for each time series separately. If you use this option, you don't see the transformations selected in this dialog box, but they are shown in later results. For this data set, you see this message when you check the Auto Detect option. As it indicates, no set of transformations can be found to make the variance stationary. This sometimes happens usually because of large swings in some part of the series. In this case, you can click OK and hope that the fit will still be adequate. The Series to Fit tab is the same as before, but now there is a Report tab. It provides several options, including the important option of estimating correlations between the time series. I will place the results in the Active Workbook. Once you click the Fit button, the main results are placed on a Time Series Fit Summary Sheet, shown here. The top part shows the best fitting processes, MA1 and again MA1. And starting in the function row, 
There are again live array formulas for future forecasts. Again, the curly brackets for array functions. As before, these can be used as inputs to a simulation. The bottom section shows the correlation matrix, which is an argument in the array formulas. There's risk core mat. If you check the first option in the report tab, you also get a separate worksheet for each time series, showing the details of the fits for each candidate process. Define and results. If you use the time series tools to generate forecasts for use as inputs in a simulation, you will probably do it as explained so far. That is, you will probably fit processes to historical data and then use future forecasts from the best fitting process as simulation inputs. However, if you have a sufficient understanding of the various processes, you can choose one directly for a simulation by using the time series define tool. Again, remember how the define distributions tool works. You choose a distribution, such as the triangular distribution, along with values of its parameters, for use as an input cell. In the same way, you use the time series define tool to choose a time series process, along with values of its parameters, for use as a time series input range. To use this tool, select Define from the Time Series dropdown. This brings up the dialog box you see here. Then you choose one of the processes, such as AR1, and click the Select Series button to bring up the next dialog box. Here you can supply a name, a range where you want the forecast to be placed, and the parameters of the AR1 process. It is not as straightforward to choose these parameters as, say, the parameters of a normal distribution. You have to have some understanding of the various time series processes. The at-risk help provides some explanations of these processes, but you should still have some background in time series theory before you use this defined tool. The forecasts are then generated in the requested range, such as you see here. They then become inputs to a typical at-risk simulation. In this case, the goal is to find the distribution of the total procurement cost over the next 24 months. Again, a live array formula is entered for the prices, and usual, that is non-time series, at-risk distributions can be entered elsewhere, such as for the units produced. I'll now run the simulation. Besides the usual at-risk results, you can click Results from the Time Series dropdown to get a report like this one. This is in addition to any of the other usual at-risk reports for simulation results. You can experiment with the buttons at the bottom of the window to show information about the time series data generated during the simulation. For example, now I am seeing overlays of the time series prices that were generated during the different iterations. The project tool in At Risk allows you to analyze your project schedules for risk. This is done by linking the simulation capabilities of At Risk with the scheduling capabilities of Microsoft Project. Using the project tool, you can answer questions such as, what is my expected project completion date? Or, what is the probability of finishing more than three months late? You can also determine the critical factors that affect the risk of a project so that you can plan mitigation strategies. Note that Microsoft Project 
any version from 2003 through 2010, must be installed on your PC before you can use At Risk's project tool. In fact, the project dropdown won't even appear on your At Risk ribbon unless Microsoft Project is installed. It is installed here. Also, to use Microsoft Project together with At Risk, you cannot be running the 64 bit version of Excel 2010. Only the 32 bit version is supported at this time. When you use At Risk's project tool, you first need a schedule created in Microsoft Project. Typically, you already have a project that was developed without including uncertainty. In other words, you will probably have a deterministic project, where all elements in the schedule have fixed values and a single completion date is generated. These schedules are saved in MPP files. At Risk's project tool imports your schedule's MPP file from Microsoft Project into Excel. Once in Excel, At Risk distributions can be added to the schedule so that a risk analysis can be performed. By using At Risk functions and Excel formulas, you are able to create better, more robust risk models than can be built in Microsoft Project alone. In addition, you can access all of the capabilities of At Risk when you work with project schedules. The schedule shown here is in Microsoft Project. It is stored in the file tutorial.mpp, available from the At Risk example files. To import this project into At Risk, you select Import MPP File from the project dropdown on the At Risk ribbon and locate the file. Note that this file doesn't need to be open in Microsoft Project. In fact, Microsoft Project doesn't even need to be open, but it will launch and open this MPP file when you do the import. You can click No when you are asked if you want to review import settings. And you can click Yes when you are asked if you want to save the import as an Excel file. I won't do so. Note that this Excel file retains a link to the MPP file. When you open this Excel file again with At Risk loaded, Microsoft Project will automatically launch and open the MPP file. What you see here in Excel is similar to what you saw in Microsoft Project. The tasks in the schedule with their durations and their start and finish dates, and you even see the Gantt chart that has a bar for each task. A second Excel worksheet lists the resources used by the project. As mentioned earlier, the imported project is also open in Microsoft Project. This is because At Risk uses Microsoft Project to perform scheduling calculations when it runs its simulations. When using At Risk, your original schedule stays in Microsoft Project, and the model for the risk analysis is built in Excel. Formulas and functions can be added to cells in Excel where the task and resource dates and values are shown. You can now add probability distributions to the durations of selected tasks. For this example, I will add discrete distributions to three of the task durations. The distributions used can be any reasonable distributions, but for this illustration, I want them to have enough variation so that you can see some range in the simulation results. So I will add discrete distributions to these three cells. I'll make them all risk discrete with possible values 4, 5, 6, 7, and relative probabilities 1, 4, 3, 2. Copy that to each of those three cells. The most likely value is still 5, but now there is variation around this. Then, just as in any at-risk model, you can specify one or more output cells. For a project, this will often be the finish date of the project. Your objective is to determine the range of possible dates for project completion, and possibly the likelihood of completing by a specified date. For this illustration, 
I will add the finish date in cell E2 as the single at-risk output cell. Now you can simulate your project by clicking the Start Simulation button. During a simulation, At Risk for Excel communicates with Microsoft Project, sending Excel values sampled from distributions and calculated in formulas to Microsoft Project. In Project, these values are inserted into the schedule and the schedule is recalculated. New output values calculated by Project are sent back to Excel so that they can be collected as simulation results. Now you can explore the results of the simulation. For example, you can see that there is about a 4.5% chance that the project won't be complete until after November 13th, because this is the beginning of November 14th. Also, a tornado chart shows that the variation in the top two tasks is much more responsible for variation in the project completion date than variation in the bottom task. When you work with the project tool, you have access to all the usual reports available and at risk. For example, you can generate quick reports of simulation results. You can create charts in Excel and reports on simulation data and sensitivity analyses. In addition, there are some new reports that are specific to project simulations. One of these is the probabilistic Gantt chart. A probabilistic Gantt chart shows by default the earliest 10th percentile and expected start date, and expected 90th percentile and latest finish dates for project tasks. It is shown in a format similar to the Gantt chart you see in both Microsoft Project and Excel. To display this chart for a simulated project, you select Probabilistic Gantt from the Charts and Reports group in the project drop-down list. This brings up the dialog box you see here with various options, and you can click OK to see the following modified worksheet. The probabilistic Gantt chart shows both the original deterministic schedule in blue and the simulated range in red. The small solid red bar for each task shows the range between the earliest possible start date and the latest possible finish date. The lightly shaded red bar for each task shows the range between the start date 10th percentile and finish date 90th percentile. The two red diamond markers for each task show the mid start and finish dates. In this case, the mid values are the means, but you can redefine them in the probabilistic Gantt chart settings dialog box. The critical index column shows the percentage of time that each task is on the critical path. Any delay in a task on the critical path will delay the project as a whole. In a deterministic schedule in Microsoft Project, a task is either critical or it isn't. However, when a project is simulated, the critical path can change in each iteration as values in the schedule are changed by at risk. The critical index ranges from 0% to 100%. Tasks with a high critical index are more likely to cause delay to the project because they are more likely to be on the critical path. It turns out that all of these are 0 or 100%, but it can easily happen that percentages are between 0 and 100%. This video has just begun to illustrate the many options in the At-Risk Project tool. You can see more of its features in the project examples in the At-Risk example files.